One of the things that we had to do at the farm store in Fredericktown when I was working there during high school with some regularity is that we had to go through and inventory the entire store. Now, this wasn't just a few hundred different things, but this was thousands upon thousands of different items that had to be gone through. They had to be counted, and we had to count against what, ha what the computer said was there so that we had the correct amount, whatever was on the shelf. And this was something that we had to be aware. We had to be looking for the right things. We had to match all of the stock numbers. We had to match whatever the product was. But we also had to be aware that we weren't just counting shelves or the things that we thought might be obvious. It was all those products and all the things that were listed on the printout so that we had an accurate count of each and every thing, that each and every thing was also in its place. And if we had to do an inventory, a spiritual searching within of our heart and our soul, would we find the right things there? Would we find what the Lord is asking us to have within our heart and our soul? Or would he find a bunch of things that ultimately do not matter and what's worse, ultimately take us away from our Lord and our God? What would he find? And to illustrate that point rather well, we have these series of readings that tell us all about what the Lord should find within our heart and our soul. The first reading is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. And the book of Deuteronomy, taken within the first five of the Bible, is one of those that really lays out law. It tells us what the Lord expects of his people, of the Israelites. And Moses serves as the mouthpiece, often telling them about all of the statutes, all of the decrees that the Lord is laying out. But in particular, he's telling them not just the statutes and decrees at this passage, but he's also telling them the why. Why do we need to follow these statutes? Why are these decrees important? Why does it all matter? And so Moses, he starts to emphasize a central point. If you follow these statutes and decrees, you may have a long life in the land that your father is giving you. And we might think about this knowing the biblical context and say, well, this would be the promised land. This would be the land that Moses had been leading the people along to for so long. And that's true in a certain respect. But we need to understand the fulfillment of everything that's carried in Leviticus. Because it's not just the promised land so long ago. It's the promised land also of the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying to all of them, if you follow these things, you will live and have a long life. Not just in this land, not just in this life, but in the life that is to come. But he also, too, goes through because he wants them to understand following the statutes and decrees. This isn't something where you can pick and choose or even add to it. It's not adding. It's not subtracting. It's following everything that the Lord has laid out and doing it so well that other nations, they can look from outside and they can say that these people are wise. These people are intelligent. These people are following all the laws, statutes, and decrees that have been laid out. And in it, Moses, too, wants to emphasize a couple of points. First, that they have a God that is so close to them. No other God or false God that has ever come before is as close to them as their God. Because their God will hear them. Their God will answer their prayers. Their God will listen to whatever plight they're in. But also, their statutes and decrees are far beyond any, el any else or any other as well. Because the reality of these statutes and decrees, they are more just than anything that has ever come before. And so it's not just about following these laws or these rules because they're a sort of checklist. Do all these things and you can enter into the promised land. It's do all these things because they're right. Because they make you more like your Lord and more like your God. And the Responsorial Psalm, it relays this to us as well. The one who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. The one who follows the commands of the Lord will in fact live with our Lord and our God, not just now, but for all of eternity. Then we move on to the letter of St. James, and he starts to tell them that all great things and all good gifts come from God, but in particular, it's the Word that gives them new birth. This word is indeed synonymous with Jesus, but we also have to understand that the word also spoke. It gave commandments. It gave things that the people are to do if they want to live a life of Christian discipleship. And so that word, it's not just to be heard. And St. James is very aware of the fact how one could hear the word and just simply let it pass through their other ear. He doesn't want them to do that. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Actually act upon what you're hearing the Lord say. And in fact, that is part of the Christian mission. That is what it is to be an authentic 
authentic disciple. And so he wants them to actually do these things. But then he also goes on because he doesn't want them to get this idea that religion is just this system of beliefs. He says, religion, pure and undefiled, will in fact benefit the widow and the orphan, and it will set aside all these worldly things that seek to defile one. And so he's reminded them, they have several things that they need to do. But if they do these things well, if they pay attention to the widow and the orphan, those that are on the furthest down and out of society, and if they put aside worldly ways and instead follow their Lord and God, they will have truly attained religion. Then it's religion, pure and undefiled. Then finally, we move on to the gospel according to Mark, and we're told that the Pharisees and the scribes, they all gather around Jesus, and it becomes very clear they have some sort of motive. They've noticed something, and they want to interrogate Jesus about it. And so they ask him, why do your disciples eat with unclean hands? And Mark clarifies, that means unwashed. They just simply didn't wash their hands. And it seems rather odd or absurd that the Pharisees and the scribes, they're confronting Jesus and just asking, why don't your disciples wash your hands and wash their hands before they eat? And in a certain respect, we would think of this as a practical matter, not necessarily a spiritual one. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they know that this is a certain tradition, but they don't know what underlies the tradition. And Jesus picks up on this, and he says to them very clearly that they've gotten it all wrong. That yes, they understand that there is purification, and they don't just purify their hands, but we're told that there are pots and kettles and jugs and beds and all sorts of other things. They're setting themselves about and busying themselves with purifying everything, but they've gotten it all wrong because they're following the traditions of the elders, but not necessarily the commandments of God. But yes, they're going through and meticulously observing everything that's been taught for years and years and generation after generation, but they don't know why. They don't understand. And in fact, what's worse is they start to do all these things to ultimately distract from what is within, what's in their heart, what's in their soul. Because the reality is, they can perform all of these things very well. They can meticulously make sure that every part of their house is sparkling clean, but they'll ultimately be defiled because they haven't paid attention to their heart. They've gotten their inventory right on the outside, but not on the inside where it truly matters. And the Lord tells them about licentiousness, about envy, about blasphemy, about unchastity, about adultery, about all these other other vices that can ultimately take root. He tells them, you're not paying attention to what matters, all these things that truly do defile. You're paying attention to what does not defile, and instead letting what does defile just run rampant in your heart and your soul. You're paying attention to and inventorying your soul in all the wrong ways. You're paying attention to the wrong things. But what does that mean for us? Well, we need to understand very clearly that oftentimes whenever we are confronted with law, with statute, with decree, with church teaching, so many times we get this worldly mindset where it's simply that we kind of see those things, but we kind of get to pick and choose. And the world at large, it tells us that either we can pick and choose or we can just set all these things to the side. But that is a misunderstanding of church law and teaching and God's commandments. Because we have to understand first and foremost, God's teaching, God's law, God's commandment, it is for our good. It is for our benefit that it ultimately sets man free and allows him to truly attain perfection, at least in the next life. So following God's law and all the commandments and even church teaching to the fullest degree that we can, that that's important. Because as we see, as we look at the first reading, Moses, he tells the Israelites, why do we follow God's law? Because it gives us life. And not just in this life, but in the life that is to come. And two, we also have to realize that God's law, we can hear it, it gives life, but we also have to understand, we can't just listen to it idly on Sunday and then go do whatever we want, as if we're indifferent, or what's worse, that we're made even worse or more depraved by having heard the Word of God. Because we need to not only hear the Word of God, we not only need to hear His commandments, we not only need to listen to what the church teaches, we also have to observe it. We have to do, and we have to live our lives full of charity, especially paying attention to those that are on the down and out the most, the widow, the orphan, and making sure that we do not adopt worldly ways to ourselves, that we kind of make excuses or accept ourselves and say that the worldly ways, we need to be smart in those ways. It's not so much that. 
Rather, we need to put aside worldly ways so that we can live out our faith and religion pure and undefiled. But in all that, we need to understand, too, that when we see this gospel, when Jesus is chastising the Pharisees and the scribes, why is he doing so? Because they're paying attention to the wrong things. They've ultimately chosen, yes, to follow the law very meticulously and to the utmost degree, so much so that they eat even just a small snack. They're out there, they're washing their hands, purifying and making sure that they are made purified on the outside, but not on the inside where it truly matters. And that's what the Lord is chastising them about. It's like, you've got all these things, you're paying attention to the tradition of the elders, and you're doing all these different requirements, following the statutes and decrees in a certain sense. But you're not learning to love your Lord. You're not learning to love your God. You're not learning to love your neighbor. You're not learning to put aside all those things, all those vices, all those sins and weaknesses that get in the way of your life of faith. You're not putting them outside. You're simply just making excuses. You're making it as if you're whitewashed. You're making sure that the outside appears pure, perfect, but inside there's all sorts of things that are ultimately acting for your ruin. And that, in fact, might be something for us to consider. Because when it comes to God's law and understand that we need to do God's law, it requires us to come to a moment where we have to assess. We have to take inventory. We have to look into the depths of our heart and our soul and say, how am I doing? And not just on the outside, not just whenever you think others are paying attention, but deep down where it matters, where we speak to our Lord in our conscience, in our heart and our soul, where we interface with our God. How are we doing there? Because so often we get so tempted to just simply pay attention to the externals. I'm not going to say the bad thing about that person. I'm just going to think it. I'm not going to spew hatred at them. I'm just going to really hold it down and boil it down into a grudge that I hold on to forever. And the Lord, we might have thought he would say, as long as you hold it inside, that's okay. That's not what he said at all, is it? Rather, what he said was, these things come from within. They defile they ruin a person. They ultimately work for his eternal desolation and eternal death because they do not allow the life and the love of God as the law would have them understand. Because if they truly understood all of the things that the law was telling them, what it was teaching them, it was teaching them to be pure, to be holy, to be clean within, not just paying attention to the externals, but also the inside as well. And that, in fact, is where our work is, my brothers and sisters. Because I don't know about you, but I've got a few things that I need to pay attention to. A few things that, as I do an inventory of my heart and soul, that need to be cast aside so that I can truly make room for love of God, of my neighbor, and of his law. So that I can pay attention to the things that matter and make room for that. But what about all of us? Where are we at on that spiritual inventory? Where are we at on paying attention to God's law and not just in a way where we can kind of take a perfunctory glance or kind of do it in a superficial way, just kind of applying God's law where we think it might fit? All the way through and through. What is in our heart and our soul? Is it the good things the Lord wants? Is it true purity and cleanliness and holiness as the Lord would have us seek after? Or is it those objects of defilement that he mentioned? Is there fury? Is there malice? Is there evil thoughts? Are there all these other things? And to be clear, my brothers and sisters, none of us goes around and says, I'm a person filled with malice, and we just kind of run around saying that. That's not what we do. We start to make excuses. We say, this malice or this hatred is here because this person did this thing to me, or this thing happened, or whatever it is. We make excuses day and night, and we start to tell ourselves, this is why these things, they need to stay there. That these things that the Lord tells us to the defile, that we just say, well, it doesn't in this case because X, Y, and Z. That's not true. And these things that defile, they make our heart and our soul the devil's playground. That these things, if we start to excuse ourselves and say, I have hatred because of this, I have fury, I have all of these things, I even think myself better than everyone else because of these reasons. Well, then we start to find ourselves in ruin. And my brothers and sisters, our Lord doesn't want that. 
Jesus is very clear that we need to be made whole and made pure time and time again. And we need to be aware of what is on our heart and our soul and not make excuses, not tell our Lord, this is why this thing is there. The Lord will not care about excuses at the end of the day. The Lord will say, these things are here. Why didn't you pay attention to them? Why didn't you remove them? They defiled you. He doesn't want their excuses. He wants us to ultimately choose love. He wants us to choose to be clean, to put aside all those things that the devil often plants in our heart and our soul. That he wants us to choose to be made new, to choose to live in the joy of the Lord, to truly may be made clean and to be made whole so that we can truly have more room for our Lord and our God. And that, in fact, is where the work is. Because so many times, especially in this day and age, my brothers and sisters, there are all sorts of reasons that we can start to tell ourselves these things are okay. The Lord doesn't really care. But indeed, He does. And the door of the confessional remains open because the Lord knows very well how much we struggle, how much we might be tempted to make excuses for these things. That the door of the confessional remains open so that we can cross the threshold and we can ultimately say that even though we struggle with these things, even though we've gone through a spiritual inventory, even though we've done that examination of conscience, we found these things in our hearts and our souls, that we're trying to follow God's law more wholeheartedly. And that, in fact, is what we need to do, my brothers and sisters. We need to make an examination of conscience, not just when we get to it once every few years. We should realistically be doing it at least every few days, if not every day. That we should be assessing, where is my heart and my soul? Where are those places where I'm ultimately holding out on my God? Where are those things that are defiling my soul, that are making it a place of ruin, that are making it a place of anger, of bitterness, of hatred, of fury, of so many different vices and sins, too many to list here? Where are those places so that I can throw them to the side? I can cast them before the Lord and throw them at His feet so as to receive His mercy to be made new, to be made pure, to be made clean again. That is what our Lord cares about. And yes, my brothers and sisters, each of us are struggling in our own ways. That's nothing new. The question is, whenever we assess and whenever we take inventory of what is in our heart and our soul, whenever we find all these evils and whenever we find what threatens to defile, are we willing to stop making excuses and instead beat upon the door of the confessional, run to the Lord in His mercy, and truly make our hearts and our souls places of purity, of cleanliness, and truly seek after our Lord and our God in a spirit of love? Because that's what the Pharisees and scribes got wrong. Yes, they were great at following all these meticulous details, all these statutes and decrees, but ultimately they made excuses when it came to the things that really mattered. And my brothers and sisters, the Lord doesn't need our excuses. He needs our love. He needs us to follow His law and His commandments because He wants us to truly live life perfectly into the best of our ability, that He truly wants us to reach our fullest potential. And that's why His law is here so that we can truly assess what is on the inside and truly seek after our Lord, even in the times where we need to ask for His forgiveness and His mercy. My brothers and sisters, let's not be like the scribes and Pharisees. They might have gotten some things wrong, but ultimately where it truly mattered, they were lacking so much. May each and every one of us continue to commit ourselves to seeking after our Lord and truly inventorying and taking account for what is in our heart and our soul, casting aside all evil and truly making room for our Lord and our God, love for Him and love for His law as well.